Ramble. Welcome to Curious with Josh Peck. Start the show. Welcome back to the Curious Podcast. My name is Josh Peck, and your name is insert name here, and you are the listener. And this is just exciting because it's it's the new year. Happy fucking new year, y'all. Wow. My podcast has now fallen on Christmas and the new year, and I don't think that's a coincidence, guys. I feel like the universe has conspired to have me be the one who ushers in these seminal events, these major, these, it's a, these are bank holidays. Everything is closed. I'll tell you what's not closed. This fucking auditory care package that I'm delivering to your ears. We don't ever close here at the Curious Podcast 24-7. We're like the 7-Eleven of podcasts. You're welcome. Um, I'm excited for all your New Year resolutions. I'm sure you're going to see them all through. And I can't wait to hear what happens in 2020. All the progress you've made. Right? Because that's what the New Year gives us. Endless possibility. I hope you're all resolute. You've got your resolutions locked and loaded. And you're just going to machine gun fire them, you know, all over the new year. All over the coming months. Why not? Right? I mean, everything's different. We've crossed an imaginary border. And there's no way we're going to bring in any of the neuroses and bad programming and character defects that we had in 2018 and basically our entire lives. No, this is a restart. And it's going to be exciting. And I can't wait to go on uh, the social medias, the Instagram and whatnot, and just hear how excited everyone is. And to hear everyone's, uh, you know, motivating words, because everybody's got some. And everyone wants to give you their two cents. And here are mine. Are you ready? Get excited. Do you have a pen and paper? Of course you don't. It's 2019. What do you mean? Nobody carries that. Uh, my resolution is for more of the fucking same. That's my resolution. I just want a little bit more of the same. My life's pretty all right. And uh, I hope it stays okay. That's all I want, and I think that's all we can all hope for. You know what? Maybe. Here's my resolution. You ready? Strike that. Reverse it. I want to be like 2% better. Yeah. And if I can achieve that, if I can be like the 2% better Josh Peck, I think I will have like really just blown it out of the water. That that will be quite the incredible feat. Um, yeah, I just, I'm not a fan of this whole like group new beginning, you know, this sort of arbitrary January 1st of it all. Nah, you you want to impress me, change it up like midday on a Wednesday in March, you know, or change your life like at the end of August when, uh, you know, when it's, it's like way too hot outside and, and, and like summer's been going on too long. That's when I want to see some change. You know, that's when I'm impressed. January 1st, it's a little, I mean, it's a little basic. I don't know. Um, Today's guest, Carly Chaikin, my friend. She's an actress. She's an artist. She's just an all around wonderful person. And most importantly, she loves the Curious Podcast. And that is, I mean, it means a lot. Um, we had a really good conversation. I'm so excited to share it with you guys. Carly's the best. Here you go. Happy New Year. Here's Carly. You were into golf? I wasn't into golf, but I was really good at golf, and they wanted me to be into golf. Huh. And I hated it more than anything, but now I golf. How about that? I know. You have... Fun fact. God, so multi-layered. I have a lot of hobbies. Um, (laughs) tell me more. What other hobbies? And I also, like, this is just going to make me really out myself as a big loser, but that's fine because I am bowling. Sick. Are you great at bowling? I'm either amazing or horrible. That means you you have lack of technique. Yeah. (laughs) I'm very inconsistent. (laughs) Yeah. My high score is like a 
175 or something. Nice. I know. And then my low score is like a 90. That's rough. Mm -hmm. I am not an incredible bowler. I I feel like I average in the low 100s (laughs) most Mm -hmm. times. Solid. But I'm all in. I'm all in on the bowling experience. It's so fun. I like the chicken tenders delivered. Mm -hmm. I like the. I like changing my shoes in front of other people. (laughs) I have my own bowling shoes. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Own ball. Yes. Oh wow. (laughs) I was in a bowling league, uh, like years ago, and it was literally one of the most fun things I've ever done. I bet. You just get like really drunk and bowl, and you're with all these people and. It's pretty amazing. It's the fucking simple pleasures. That's what it is. Yeah. Um, so you grew up in LA? I grew up in Santa Monica. Where were you born? Cedar Sinai. I respect. You're mm-hmm. part of the tribe, right? Are you Jewish? Mm-hmm. Okay, me too. Worried. Baruch. Yeah. <laughs> Love that. Cedar Sinai, where if you're a Jew in LA, that's what you're I shooting for. I was bar mitzvah. Strong. I was bar mitzvah. Mm-hmm. So you were raised Jewish in Santa Monica. What was that like? It was normal. Yeah. I mean, it's Santa Monica. (laughs) Everybody, it's so funny because being in this industry and being from LA, everybody acts like it's just the craziest thing they've ever heard in their entire life. Right. Um, But obviously it was normal. Did you go, where'd you go to high school? I went to Archer and I went to New Roads. Okay. So you went to all girls at Archer. Mm-hmm. And then New Roads is like private-ish. Like kind. hippie school. Yeah. Yeah. And what was your, re- you know, obviously I would imagine growing up in like an industry town like that was entertainment or acting just sort of like a part of your experience from as far back as you can remember, like always around you? Not really. It was kind of, you know, my dad's a doctor. Okay. My mom's a therapist. My sister you know, has always been very academic and, you know, went to medical school um, and, like, long story, whatever, you know, is becoming a therapist now. So, and I only played sports. I never did any school plays or drama. So it was, like, so not in my world um, that when I told my dad I wanted to be an actress or that I was going to be an actress, he... Almost had a heart attack. Really? I was like, I'm not going to go to college, and I'm going to be an actress. Uh, just as a quick aside, I'm interested. When you're, I've heard that having a parent or parents that are uh, doctors, that they tend to never take you to the doctor, or they like neglect <laughs> their own. Is that true? Well, I would. My poor dad. We would just. I'd be like, I don't need to go to a doctor, I have you. Right. And he all the time still, I'm like, what's wrong with me? And he finally has gotten like, you need to stop calling me. Everybody needs to stop asking me and like get your own doctor. I imagine that that would be so annoying because I have a doctor family friend. I want to call her for everything. Everything. I get a hangnail. I want to be like, Dr. Tiffany. Yeah. Am I going to live? What is going on? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think this is septic and I... Pretty sure I have weeks left. Yeah, plan my funeral. <laughs> what kind of doctor? A cardiologist. Okay, so like, no joke. I mean, he this guy knows what he's talking about. He's very smart. My dad is amazing. And was he good about, because I've also heard, like my my father-in-law's dad was a doctor, and he, but he was like, I don't think my dad ever went to the doctor. Like, so was your dad good at sort of like if he was under the weather, wasn't feeling right? that he would go in and have it looked at? Oh, my dad? Yeah. No. Right. No, he what doesn't. What is that? Because he's like, what are they going to tell me that I don't already know? Not right? a bad, not totally wrong, but not totally <laughs> right. <laughs> like, I think if it was like, you know, he definitely, he's good at monitoring himself. Like, he'll check his blood. Like, he makes sure makes sure that all of that is like, monitored and whatever but if he has a cold or something he's like what are they you have a cold right like he's like i know (laughs) yeah i'll tough it out yeah (laughs) i'm gonna make it as a um well-seasoned hypochondriac such as myself my favorite place is the hospital well so the best thing about having a doctor father um is and it's like 
I'm like, who wants like a celebrity parent? I can get into the ER like with a snap of a finger. Ooh, that's nice. Which is amazing. Yes. To have an in at like hospitals is pretty good. Does he have privileges like at Cedars or whatever? Yeah. Well, and when Century City, like he has his own private practice, but when there was Century City, like doctor's hospital and stuff, he was the chief of staff there and has been like on the board at Cedars and all this stuff. So he, people like him over there. Wow. I always imagine, I'm obsessed with health and doctors and medicine. Mm -hmm. Like, I, if I've been on planes where they've made the announcement, is there a doctor on board? Because like someone had a peanut allergy or mm -hmm. like was getting anxiety attack. And I wonder what that power feels like to be like, yes, and I'm the one. <laughs> yeah. I'm, the, I'm that doctor and I'm here to help. I can do something. Yeah, it's insane. Do, I'm I mean, like, do you want me to do a monologue? <laughs> like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I can, uh, you know, I can distract you as you're slowly dying yeah. with my hysterical licks. <laughs> <laughs> what, have you ever ha had to see your dad sort of go into action? Like a friend of yours got hurt playing outside or someone was like having a heart attack at, at your local Denny's and they had, he had to run <laughs> the help. I actually haven't, but the stories that he tells me are really cool. Um, or disgusting. And he, he always sends me like, he reads all the medical journals and then I'll get all these emails that he forwards about with like disgusting pictures yeah. and he's like, LOL. And it's like someone's eyeball like coming out of their face. But he, he'll tell me stories that are very like, wow, you're amazing. And then yeah. also horrible stories from when he was younger as like a residence in Chicago. I, I wonder too, like if when you have someone there who's actually saving lives. And so like, if you were calling him being like, my audition went poorly. <laughs> yeah. and he's like, well, I lost someone today, so I don't want to hear it. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm like, oh, I the hardest day at work. <laughs> right. Yeah. I dropped two of my lines. Yeah. <laughs> like, um, yeah. It's a really interesting. Yeah. I'm, I'm fascinated by that. I, um, Okay, wait. So I wanted to ask, so you get the last song, and that's with Miley Cyrus? Mm -hmm. And you're friends with her, right? Or you were? Or yeah, you... after we did that movie, we became, but, you know, summer camp friends. Talk about that, because for me, I had to sort of educate my wife in, in that way of, you know, I would, I, and I had some wonderful experiences with, with certain people I'd worked with, and I would talk about that. And then she'd say, well, why don't you invite them to so-and-so? Or how come you haven't talked to them? And I'd be like, oh, it doesn't work like that. <laughs> like, it doesn't. It's a moment. Yeah, it's so funny because, and after that, I was like, wait, what happened? You know, in the beginning, you're like, oh, wait, I thought we were friends. But you soon, and it's nobody's fault. And I literally just, basically, it's like summer camp. You become best friends with these people. You're with them all the time you know, doing acting together, which is a very vulnerable thing. You're together for hours and then you wrap something and you're like, oh my God, we're going to see each other all the time. And you never speak again. Ever. Or like the occasional. Yeah. I know. And now I've, I kind of, you know, there's obviously those rare people who you do. Um, but I had just did this movie earlier in the year and with like two amazing people and we still talk sometimes, but Zach, one of the guys was like, no, it was one of his first things. And he was like, Oh no, no, no. We are going to be like, we're still going to hang out all the time. And I'm like, it doesn't work like that. And yeah, he's like, luck. yes, it will. And then we literally have not spoken. And I texted him and was like, Hmm, what happened to this <laughs> right. like idea? And he's like, okay, you're right. Yeah. I thought we were going to go to soul cycle together. <laughs> yeah. Zach, <laughs> I, you know, it's funny, I did, I've had those sides of it where it's been like, just where I knew that we would have a great run together and then not stay close. And then, but even people like, I, I made this action movie with Chris Hemsworth and he was just everything you could ever imagine. You know, it's funny because like we had this, like we really loved each other, like more than just camp friends. And right. yet, and we, and we talked after, and I can't say I, I absolutely love him. But there also became a point, and I wonder if you had this with Miley slightly, where he became so famous, and this is all on me, not him, that it was hard to be in his orbit because 
it was like I I was so it was too much because he was succeeding at such a high level and crushing it so hard. And while I loved him and wanted nothing but the best for him and he deserved it, it brought up things for me where I felt so um, inept and like so less than that eventually, and I knew he would get busy, but we sort of, um, we sort of fell off as far as, as talking as much of the friendship went, but I just knew that like, there was sort of like a self-sustaining, self-preservation thing that clicked on for me. Like, you can't be around someone crushing it this hard. <laughs> it, it, it just kind of makes me feel like I'm, I'm not doing anything. Yeah. Well, going into that, like, I think Miley was, you know, at her peak there. I mean, not, sure. not her peak, but she was like still she was Miley Cyrus and Hannah Montana. Um, but no, it is, it's always interesting watching somebody just like keep like rising and rising and you're like, Whoa, yeah, you go. It's fascinating. Yeah. It's a tough, you know, especially I've really had to learn over the years about, you know, like comparing myself to other people and like how I measure up to this, that or the other. And, I've really had to, you know, I think the more successful or things that you do, the more comfortable you get with what you're doing. And it's not as, it doesn't make you feel as insecure when somebody else is like on a billboard. You're not like, why am I not on a billboard? Right. Um, but I think, you know, over the years, like the more confidence that you get, the easier it is not to always compare yourself. But it's very hard not to in this industry, especially. Compare and despair. Mm -hmm. Am I right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I think it's something, I think you're right to a certain extent. You know, one thing that Retta said when I was listening back to our interview that was very um, telling for me, and, and I, I forgot that she had said it, but then listening back, I was like, yes, like this is so... She just sort of talked about like her improvising as an actress and working in comedy. And she's like, I've improvised with the best of them. Like I've done it now at a level in which, so I, she's like, I'm not terrified anymore. And I too, you know, only in the last couple of years, I've sort of realized that, you know, for better or for worse, and I might never have the success that I want or might peter out at a certain level, but like I've worked at a high level before. So it's... It's all the same shit. Like, we're going to do this and it'll go great or it'll just go okay. It probably won't go terribly because we'll all work to make sure that doesn't happen. But, like, getting over that fear of, like, oh, God, everyone's going to see, under, you know, past my cover and, and realize I'm a hack. Like, getting over that fear, for me at least, has been a big, uh, a long process. Totally. And that's, like, every – is this a good distance? Yeah, you can be closer. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, I always am like, before I start a job, I start freaking out and I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to get fired. Yeah. Like at the table read, they're going to be like, what did we do? Even, you know, on Mr. Robot, like every season, I'm like, I have no idea what I'm doing. I can't do this. Oh my God. And you just have this like... And on Suburgatory, too, every season, I was like, can't do it. I'm going to yeah, get fired. That's They're it. They're all going to be like, what is wrong with her? And you just doubt everything while at the same time being like, you know what? I'm, I'm a great actress and blah, blah, blah. But like in the same breath being like, I'm going to get fired and everybody's going to hate me and I'm going to be horrible. But that can't still be like I would imagine for someone like you, it has the volume lessened on that voice or the swing of it gotten a little better? Yeah. I mean, I just did this thing, um, this Hulu thing that's coming out. I don't know if I'm allowed to like whatever yet, but who knows? Whatever. On a, <laughs> on a popular streaming service, you've, yeah. <laughs> you've done a project. Go on. It's coming out in January. Um, and. You know, I, I like, I'm a pretty confident person and have like learned to own what I can do and all of that stuff. And then, and so I'm like ready to do this. And then we have the table read. And then all of a sudden I'm like, I'm going to get fired at the table read. 
I'm going to go to the table read. They're going to think I'm horrible and they're going to recast me and I'm going to get fired. So that's still, <laughs> I don't uh, know if that ever goes away. Does it? Do you feel like that? Yeah. Two things. I, I feel a weird mix of things. Although people that I've, I've interviewed who have, you know, someone like Vincent D'Onofrio or who's got like an incredible list of credits echoes something similar of like a, you know, there being this inherent fear that probably is just your way of, of it's like a subconscious way of, of your body preparing itself for whatever the task at hand is. Right. And yet I've gotten to sort of the place where I've realized that I know what I can do. I've, I've done parts where I felt like I was the wrong guy where inevitably I felt like maybe they liked how I auditioned and maybe early on I was right, but somehow it's revealed itself that I'm just not the right person for this. And I just kind of say like, listen, I can make this the best that I can. I can improvise. I can put it in my own words. I can really massage this and you can help me do that. Or I can just do the best I can with the text you've given me and this might just not be perfect. And there's nothing in my control or your control it, unless you just recast me. And, right. <laughs> and while like, I never want that to be the case, I know that, you know, it's, I've heard that about like Woody Allen and people who just, he will cast someone. And if they're not right three weeks in, he will replace them, which oh is God. terrifying. I would die. I would die. I would die. But it, it's almost like he's, He's like almost saying like I could do he's like I could do a dance with you and try, we could work on this for 2 weeks and try to massage the performance but the reality is But you, then why would you hire them? I know. Well, sometimes they're wrong. Sometimes people are wrong. Yeah. That would, my the craziest thing to me is someone getting cast in a pilot, and getting picked up and then them getting recast. And it happens a All lot. All the time. Right? All the time. Like to friends of yours. I don't sure. even know what I would do. You'd be I'd fine. move. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I can't show my face out yeah. here. God. The shame, the horror. Fully. But for me, it's like the second I started at the table read, I was fine. The mm. second I get on set, I'm fine. It's just this like psych out that I do before for absolutely no reason. And, and then it's fine, but I still have those moments. Yeah. <clears throat> it's... It's an interesting thing. I, I, I heard, you know, when I interviewed my buddy Danny Chun, who created Grandfather, that show I was on, and, and I just before this. He works with Jonathan Slavin, my oh, yeah? coach. Cause, and um, Jonathan is on Speechless right now. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And he said something to the effect of like, he said, when I went to start working on The Simpsons when I was 22, I left my first day after walking in very confident terrified in my car driving home because I was surrounded by the funniest people I'd ever met. He said, now with the amount of success I've had and work experience and you know, my mid thirties, I, I go to work and I know that, that my talent or that whatever that thing is will show up and maybe right. it'll be a great day. Maybe it'll just be good, but it'll, it'll be enough. And I was like, yeah, that sounds healthy. Like, mm -hmm. that sounds like where we should all strive to get to. Yeah. I mean, for me, I think it's just, it's one of those things where it's like, you know, before you jump in the pool, being like, it's going to be freezing, it's going to be freezing, and you jump in and it's fine. I think yeah. it's like more, what a stupid analogy. I, think. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> more um, something like that, but... I think it's just in preparation too of if you know your stuff, you know, my coach would always say for auditions, like you should go in there and be able to do it even like through an earthquake happening. Yeah. Um, and just of having that mentality and the groundedness to kind of just trust that you know what you're doing. How do you prepare for a role? What's your process look like? I, so Acting is like my favorite thing in the entire world. And I love, I just think it's so fascinating. Um, to me, I really use the text to inform me, but I, it's really to me about asking questions. And 
it's funny because my friends and growing up, everybody would always get so annoyed because I would just ask so many questions. I'd be like, why is this called a cup and not a shlooby? And all the time, and my mom, would, it would drive her insane. Um, or my best friend will be telling me a story and be like, well, then we went to this restaurant and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, oh, what restaurant? And she's like, that has nothing to do with the story. Oh, I'm yeah. like, oh, how old was the waiter? And get so frustrated, but that's what serves me the most in acting is because I, you know, will read something and just ask so many questions of like, well, why is she saying this? Who is that person? Um, you know, what kind of car? Like just all of those things to be so specific and understand why I'm doing what I'm doing, saying what I'm saying, um, and just making really like specific choices. So it starts, you know, like I I can spend like three hours on a scene, especially for with like Mr. Robot that's so dense and well-written and intense. Subtext and yeah. nuance. That, um, you know, it's like you're a detective and trying to figure out what you're actually saying, what they're actually saying, what you're feeling and thinking and all of these things, um, you know, or to me, I like – it's like when you're talking about a friend or your mom, like the way you say their name, depending on who they are, is is so different. Whether it's like obvious or not, there's history and there's everything behind that. So to me, it's like going through this text and it's, you know, if she's makes a comment about one time going to lunch with Michael, being like, who's Michael? What was that lunch? Where did we go? Like, and just getting that, the, all of those details worked out. So when I do tell you that, it has weight to it and mm. it has like Specificity. History. Yeah. So it's, it's fun because I get to play like that detective role and like make up stories and backstories and all the stuff. It's so interesting and, and smart what you're saying. And I think that that's, it, that a lot of what you're saying has only been revealed to me in the last like two years for this, you know, I started going to Vincent D'Onofrio is a client of my managers and we were at a dinner once, no big deal. Like what a dinner <laughs> with famous people. And he was like, if you actually want to really work and get better at your craft, go to this teacher, this coach who changed my life. And very much to your point, she's like, general is boring, like mm -hmm. be specific. And if you're ever lost, ask why, mm -hmm. why am I, why, why do, do I say that? Why do they say that? Why are we here? Why is she doing that? And and you're right. Well, I think it's also, you know, about making interesting choices. I think it's so much more interesting to watch someone try not to cry than to cry. Um, and, you know, for me, like, there was this one scene um, on Robot from season two where I'm, like, confronting – this woman and from the page it seems like I'd be like very aggressive and yelling at her and you know in her face and angry about it and I just thought it would be so much more interesting if I just like got really close to her and intimate and like whispered it and quiet and kept it like really contained you know um and so I just think too it's like finding those like well, this is the obvious way, but, like, what would make it more interesting to watch? Um, and, like, getting creative with that and creative with, like, your approach or the way you want to portray something. Are you good at getting in, or are you good at overcoming sort of that inherent insecurity that we have as actors, especially when we're becoming vulnerable or trying something in front of a crew and everyone watching us and inevitably the entire world <laughs> like are you are you good at sort of overcoming that 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 fear or are you just inherently kind of an open person and you, and you don't have a fear to be vulnerable in front of others once it's funny once the camera is rolling i have no problem hmm. but before in rehearsal or if somebody wanted to rehearse with me one on one not in a million years could I do that. Like if I, I can't go there in rehearsal, I can't go there like, you know, in a director, with a director on the side, 
but I have like such a guard up about it. But the second that they say action and it's time and the cameras are rolling, I have zero problem doing it. Yeah. There's a certain alchemy when you know it's fucking on the line. Yeah. When it counts. <laughs> but I know people who like will rehearse and they'll just go like full out. And I'm like, whoa, how yeah. do you do that? They got a lot to give. <laughs> they have a lot. It's a fucking <laughs> lot in that tank. <laughs> yeah. Who are you? We know that somewhere in the world, someone downloaded this podcast, but we don't know anything about you. The people who support this show would love to know just a little bit about who is listening. If you have two minutes, it really does only take two minutes. Help us make the show an even better experience for you by telling us more about yourself. Just go to listenerq, L-I-S-T-E-N-E-R-Q dot com slash curious and take the short survey. You can also give us direct feedback on the show, which we would love to hear. And as a thank you, you'll be entered into a drawing for a $100 Amazon gift certificate. Yeah. Two minutes. ListenerQ.com slash curious. That's ListenerQ.com slash curious. You know, I, I would imagine, and, and forgive me if I'm projecting, but you've had a career in the sense of where, like, you've done projects that worked and and went and people liked and and were of notice and that and yet we're always trying to attain that rarefied air of that thing that's like a critical hit everybody's watching it you start to get awards all the all the cash and prizes so when you started on something like Mr. Robot and then inevitably people reacting to it the way they did were you kind of like fucking yes like yes this is this is the one this is the one I I've been working towards. Um, I feel like if I was Rami, like who plays Elliot, right? It would. I probably would be really just like, yep. Um, but it was so crazy, and it all it all happened so fast, but like so slow at the same. Like it just it all just kind of happened, and you were like in this whirlwind of this world being like, what's going on? And it was just like such a crazy thing that like when you're in it, you don't realize how crazy it is. Like it looks so much crazier from the outside. Um, but it was just, it was very bizarre, but it feels like, because it's not my show, sure. that it feels like really amazing and crazy to be a part of something like this and to like be on the stage at the Golden Globes and go to the Emmys and all these things. But to me, I'm like, not until like I'm Elliot yeah. <laughs> and like, that's like my show. That's when I feel like I'll be more of like, yes, that, I did it. Right. Arrived. Yeah. Um, so I have a very interesting relationship with Mr. Robot or like Didn't you test for it? Yeah. I have I yeah. Tell me everything. Well, I mean I get let me qualify with this. I know Rami and like my it, my relationship with him, he's never like I couldn't be happier for him cuz he's always been incredibly cool and like you know, as you know, like we meet so many people in the same circles or that we're, we go against in auditions and some of those people were like, fuck you forever. <laughs> and others you're like, yeah, dude, like you're one of the good ones. And I've always felt that about Rami. And, and now having seen the show and seen exactly what Sam's vision was, I'm like, this, you were born for this, dude. Like it yeah. was always yours. So I'm co uh, incredibly proud and supportive and, and I shouldn't even have to qualify that, but I will. But yeah, I, I have, it's a confession. I, I have a weird relationship with it, which is why I've not been able to watch it. Cause I'll be honest, it still kind of hurts. Yeah. And, but yeah, I, you know, I, I, it's how it goes in this business. I audition. I, um, I went to the callback. I have a friend that's good friends with the executive producer and that friend probably for the worst was in my ear like dude i heard you killed it like did a great job i'm like 
ah, oh, maybe. And so, you know, what goes through our head is fucking actors. I'm like, totally. I'm like, wow, I'm going to be spending six months a year in New York. Like, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I'm, I'm going to need a new coat. <laughs> I also, I loved one of the things you said. I was dying when you were like, I wonder what the craft service is going to be like when yeah. you're talking, just like jumping to that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm like, whoa, like. I'll probably really hit my stride like beginning of season three. (laughs) Stupid projecting. Totally. We're all guilty. And and I still, it was so funny. So I was going on a trip that I had planned for two months because a buddy of mine, a a mutual friend of of Rami and mine, my buddy PJ was like, you can't fucking, he's like, you are not your fucking khakis, bro. You don't work at the Gap. If you want to take a trip, take a trip. And if something comes up, then whatever. But, like, don't keep your schedule clear at the prospect that you might get a job. Of course. You book a trip and you'll get a job. So I have this trip and I fucking – and they're, like, screen test is, like, right the day you're supposed to leave for this trip or, like, halfway through. So I'm like, all right. So I cancel the trip. (laughs) I'm like, I got to go to this thing. I'm fucking, like – in the mega dome, like the tower at Universal. Like I'm in past the Imperial Guards. I'm in the fucking Death Star and I'm there and it's me and Rami and like these two other guys and I'm like in it. I'm so embarrassed. I'm like, I'm not talking to anyone. I'm fucking like just in it. And and like Rami's there and he looks totally like normal and like not not overly consumed by it, just like very relaxed and I'm like, He's too relaxed. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm like staring at the freeway, like just, you know, smoldering. <laughs> and I audition, and I rem- and it was crazy. And I was like, and I went on the trip that night. And I'm like, well, give it away. I'm like, now I'm going to go on this trip and whatever happens, happens. They didn't let me know anything for 10 days. while I'm- What? And, you know, usually with tests. It's like a week. Or sometimes they call you that day because like, all the people that matter were in the room. Right. So sometimes they just know and they go, yeah, call them, you know, congratulate them or tell them to fuck off. So I'm like, I'll go on this trip so I won't think about the audition. Carly. Oh my God. I thought about it every second. And then I literally landed from like a crazy cross Pacific flight from Asia and I get an LAX and like I see my manager's name on my phone and I'm like, oh fuck. It's not, it's not mine. It's not mine. I'm like, hey. He's like, yeah, it's not ours. I'm like, okay, cool. So uh, that all said, like, that's just how it fucking goes. Yeah. And it was always Rami's part, and he's the perfect person for it. But it's when I started seeing those billboards, uh, I was like, oh, I'm fucking, can't get away from this. (laughs) It's crazy. Yeah. But I'm sure you have that for some other show or, you know, thing that didn't click. Yeah, I mean... You know, and it's also funny, I would love to see your tape for that. But it would be a totally different show if totally. if you did it or if some, you know. Ellie, it would be like chubby. <laughs> like, a hundred percent. You're right. Sorry. And, you know, so I, going, you know, with the comparing and all of that too, I've kind of early on from Jonathan, my coach, like learned that there really is no competition because if they want you then they definitely don't want me and if they want me they definitely don't want you and and so I there have been times where I'm like I am so right for this part like this is mine there's like there's no other thing you know and then I don't get it and it's like what more could you have wanted but I've also have really learned as like kumbaya or whatever as it sounds like of just like trusting everything happens for a reason like when suburgatory got canceled I was so devastated and pissed off and you know everything and I was like okay this is this happened for some reason something's gonna come up that I wouldn't have been able to do if this show hadn't gotten canceled and then Mr. Robot came up and I ended up doing that and you know so I With those kinds of things, I'm always like, there's a reason why I didn't get this and there's something else or, you know, emotionally wouldn't have been able to handle this role or, you know, but I always think like if you were going to cast a movie about your life and I've like said this to other actors and I'm like, if you're going to cast a movie about your life, like, would you cast me as your wife? 
Right. Probably not. Right. But that doesn't mean I'm not like pretty or like talented or what. It's just like I don't have that essence. Like sure. it has nothing to do with you or as like your talent or looks as an actor. It's like you just don't have the essence of what they're looking for. So I try and really like there are the times where I'm like, fuck you. I don't care about your stupid essence. Like it is me. <laughs> yeah. Um, but for the most part, you also go on, I go on so many auditions that I don't get that I'm just like, ugh, whatever. I think that's the attitude to have. I, I went into for an audition yesterday and the part was for someone who was 27. The character was written that and I'm like 31, but like, yeah, it might be a little old, but I, I could pass. And I walk in, and, like, there's three guys who are 45 sitting there <laughs> for the same role. And I'm like, well, what the fuck? I'm like, why don't they make up their mind, decide what they want? I'm like, I'm not going to get it if that that's the direction. And it's just amazing. Are you a small talk in the uh, audition room type person? Like, in the waiting room, will you talk to the other actresses? Are you very in your in your zone? I won't. I'm like, I won't not talk to people, mm. um, but I kind of, I was in a, in the waiting room for something and, um, fuck, what's that? He played a Pam's like ex on the office. I don't know. Do I'm you? not an office guy. What? Krasinski, I should, I know everyone likes this show. Wow. I'm kind of the anti, I don't like wow. what's popular usually. You know what? I didn't like The Office at first, and then it grew on me, and now it's like absolutely the best show on the planet. I hear that. Wow. I'm sorry. Very, uh, very thrown off right now. You ever watch Fauda on Netflix? Now there's a show. <laughs> I actually haven't, but my friend has told me about it. Well, us Jews are very proud of that show because <laughs> we're like badass Jews. What? We never get to see each other like being, you know, Secret Service agents. That is pretty interesting. Yeah. Um. I don't even remember what I was talking about. <laughs> um, wait, what were you saying? Oh, about in auditions and Pam's Oh, talking ex. to people. Yeah, so I'll like some, if I see someone that I know, we'll all like say hi to them. But um, for the most part, I kind of just like look at my stuff and hang out. Have you, do you have any bad audition stories or bad? I, when I was first starting, I auditioned for Shark Night 3D. Sick. Wait, <laughs> with Taylor Lautner? I don't even remember. He but my coach it. will still give people the scene to work on because it's like, and then, and then it cut my face off with the propeller. And it's like the most insane thing. And I, I definitely like absolutely tanked that audition because I just – could barely take it seriously, but I walked out and called my manager and was like, I failed and I don't care. Yeah. I'm sorry. Do you ever get in your car and cry after? I do. <laughs> 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 Call my mom. I'm like, I try so hard. I remember my first audition, every five minutes I was emailing my manager being like, did I get it? Did I get it? Did you hear? What happened? Oh, my God. That's the worst. <laughs> um, and what's it been like for you? And Because I imagine being a young, attractive actress in, in this business, especially with, you know, as it's become much in the forefront with the whole Me Too of it all, like, has your experience pre-Me Too and now post- been dramatically different with the way you're treated on set by people? No, I mean, it, it hasn't for me. Um, it's funny because I never felt this. I never felt anything, any sort of way about being a woman. Um, I guess even in this world, like compared to guys, I've always have been like, girls can do anything guys can do. And I've never felt that like separation. Um, and I've been very lucky in that sense until, you know, last year. Um, ooh, I don't know if I should be talking. I went through something, Portia and I went through something with our contract um, with the show. And 
it brought up a lot of, for the first time, like, sexist, feminism, you know, just kind of injustice. and like An equal pay type thing? Not even an equal pay. It, like, just half, hmm. maybe. Um, yeah, it wasn't even like, we want the same, but it was just like the gross difference. And just, you know, a few other things. Um, that was the first time that I, that I kind of really felt like, oh, wow, the two women on the show um, feel like we're being treated pretty differently. That was, that was like the first time that I really like felt that separation that I know a lot of people talk about. But I think I've always just kind of been like very good at like standing up for myself and not taking people's shit. Um, but I definitely had, you know, this moment too where I was asked to change my contract for this thing I was doing for a guy that had just signed on. Um, and I finally, like because of – you know, something that happened with robot and, or that I'd experienced when they asked me to do that, I said, absolutely not. And that was a very, that was like a big line in the sand. <laughs> yeah. Where yeah. We, I was like, no, I'm not going to change my contract for some guy. Like that's, I'm not going to do that if they, they can work it out or they can fire me or whatever. But like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do that. And I think you know, my team was very supportive. And I think because of this movement and everything going on that people, you know, it's more of a like, yeah, like, right, totally instead of a, like, Ooh. who does she think she is? Right. Type. Yeah. What do you think that? Um... Oh, wait, I forgot. what I was on. No, I know what I wanted to say. Like, I, you know, my experience Obviously, like being a male and in this business, you know, some might say that that I, I you know, f people have a certain level of blinders on. But I'm a sentient being and I was aware of certain things. And obviously, had I had I seen anything like gross or egregious, like I would have fucking put my foot down and said that's unacceptable. So I never saw anything like that, but what I saw was this nuanced, slimy behavior from certain guys ar around actresses. I remember once this guy, I was working on this thing, and this actress was, was in the chair, and this guy just kind of, and like, I don't think he thought twice about it, but he just sort of went up behind her and started massaging her shoulders, like, <laughs> as she was sitting in the makeup chair. And he was a nice guy, and she didn't seem over, she didn't seem like she hated it, but she didn't love it. Right. And, and I'm like, and I remember that sticking in my head specifically being like, what, in what other business would that be acceptable? Like, right. Like, why do you feel like it's okay to yeah. just like come into my personal space and start rubbing my shoulders? Yeah. And then, right. And then if it's like, excuse me, what are you doing? Then you're like, whoa. Like, exactly. There's just, yeah. I mean, you get put in this like lose lose situation where, when you stick up for yourself or say like something doesn't feel right, you know, we're like trained to feel like guilty or like maybe I'm overreacting or maybe this isn't weird or it's, it's all a very bizarre thing. And no one wants a fuss and no one wants right. to be the center of attention, especially if it's in quotes negative, mm -hmm. you know? So I totally understand the fear and the reticence that was building up for people who felt like, they weren't allowed to speak up. And I, uh, yeah, and I remember like thinking that when this guy was massaging her shoulders, I'm like, she's also beautiful. I'm like, are you massaging like that lovely lady <laughs> right. who's- Come massage my shoulders. Yeah, massage my shoulders, <laughs> massage like the transpo lady's shoulders, <laughs> yeah. who's obviously been in the union for 50 years. <laughs> like, spread it around. Oh, just cause, whatever. Um, so, you're engaged. I am. Mazel. Thanks. You recently, right? Yes. Um, on the second, September second. Wow. Mm hmm How do you do it? Do you want to say, or do you want to keep that for yourself? You don't have to <laughs> give it. Whatever you want. 
He totally got me. I was I was so thrown off that it threw him off. <laughs> like Really? He yeah, I just had I knew, you know, we had been together for like four years and like nine months now. So we had talked about getting married. I knew he was gonna propose at some point. Um but was kind of like, okay, and waiting. But I just, I was at lunch with my best friend that day and was like, well, I guess it's never going to happen. Were you giving him the nudge or the hints? Oh, yeah. Okay. But, and I was at that point was like, you know what? I'm not going to say anything. And I wasn't. And I was just like, you know, it'll happen when it will happen. But was like, but it's not going to happen right now. So, you know, he told me that we were, going to dinner with um, one of our best friends, like a, this couple, Brent and Amanda. Hey. Hey, guys. I'm throwing their gender reveal party Saturday. I'm very excited. Wow. I'm the only bu- one that knows the sex of their baby. Well, share it with the <laughs> listeners. No. <laughs> um, he said we were going to dinner with them and at Nobu, and they, you know, wanted to, like, walk on the beach before – and so we okay, did to go. Okay, that sounds fabulous. I know. To meet them. And I'm like, where are they? And then he finally was like, they're not coming. And I was like, what? <laughs> you were what like, are you going to kidnap me? <laughs> yeah, I was like, what's going on? Um, and then he proposed and had this whole plan for after and brunch with our families the next day and Santa Barbara. And then we went golfing and... It was amazing. So nice. I know. Wow. So now you did a really good job. Yeah. Shout out. Respect. I did it in um in my wife in my bedroom in the morning without any pomp and circumstance in bed because I was like, ah, this is your favorite place anyway. So Mm -hmm. here you go. Um, but she said yes. So things things are looking up. (laughs) Um, and so now what? Any thoughts of like? the wedding and like all that, or are you kind of just enjoying the afterglow of it all? Um, we talked about, no, I mean, I can't wait to get married. My sister is getting married in May. So I kind of have to like let her do her thing and oh, help yeah. with that. <laughs> Cause she'll only hate you forever. Hate. <laughs> yes. Yeah. When she got engaged, cause she, we knew that we had both, been with our now fiancés like same amount of time so when she got engaged she was like you can't get engaged for like a while now (laughs) gotcha sis yeah (laughs) um but I'm going to New York in January till June for the last season of Robot and then so I'm like how do we plan a wedding so I think that it'll probably be beginning of 2020 okay Mm -hmm. I like it's a great show great Great year, great show. Perfect. You should. You guys should try to be pregnant then too, because a baby born in twenty twenty, that's ill. Yeah. Ten would... ten twenty twenty. <laughs> we'll make for, it happen. Go for October tenth. Okay. That could work great. <laughs> January, nine months. Boom. Uh huh. January. I don't want to be pregnant at my wedding. I'm talking the night of you did the conception. <laughs> <laughs> There you go. <laughs> um, that's crazy. Well, that I mean, my wife and I got married June of 2017, and we were pregnant by April of 2018. That's so exciting. I know. Do you know what it's going to be? No, we're going to be surprised. No gender reveal party. <laughs> that's so – do you have any, like, preference or, like – Girl. Girl? I would like a girl. Yeah, that's fun. Yeah, I'm just – because I'm so feminine anyway. <laughs> I'm, like, so not a dude. Yeah. That I'm really, I don't care. I really just, you know, it's funny how all the um, colloquialisms or or kind of the, the things that people say about parenthood become true immediately. Like now. I just want a healthy baby. I just want it to be healthy. <laughs> Selfishly, because I'm like, I don't want to have to take like extra care. It's enough care just if they're normal. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah. It's, You're like, I'll send it back. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> But it's weird. I mean, God, it's given me so much respect for women and, like, the process of taking a child. It's so – when does she do? December. Like, January, December. It depends. Like, within a week of New Year. So how are you going to decorate the baby's room before it comes? 
Let me tell you a little something gender about neutral. Paige Peck. <laughs> <laughs> she don't fucks with gender norms. <laughs> she's like very, she, she's, my wife's very much into neutrals anyway. Grays, right. navies, white, probably not even navy, white. And so I think no matter what, it would have been one of those um, color scapes. Mm -hmm. And then also, and I respect her for this. She takes issue with the idea that if it's a boy, you, all you get is football shirts. And if it's mm -hmm. a girl, all you get is tutus. She's like, I don't want to put that on a kid. Like, let's see what they're into as they, you know, get old enough to have an opinion. Totally. I mean, it's so interesting. It's like when you're a little girl, you're playing house and have like a fake vacuum and like a <laughs> stroller and you're like, look at me go. Yeah. And like guys are sitting there with like, you know, toys and like cars and all of these things. Like you're like programmed and trained to like those certain things yeah. um which is it's great yeah like i had a a little baby when i was a baby to play with isn't that weird they give yeah. babies to babies <laughs> they give babies to babies i had a water baby what <laughs> they were like <laughs> oh you could heat them up yeah and you like put water in the baby that's fucking and creepy. made it like re you know i mean it didn't feel like real because there was water in it but i guess that was like the idea. Dolls are weird in <laughs> general. Um, but wow, that's really, that just blew my mind. Babies holding babies. Yeah. Wow. You Lots put them in the about. stroller. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so this is now like one of my, cl my closing question that I've started to ask everyone on the podcast, but it's new. So this is like the fourth time I'm, I'm asking. Okay. It. What are, if you could think of two or three or five of the Carly commandments, things in which that you live your life by and would want to impress upon someone in the future? Okay. And you could take a moment. <laughs> <laughs> and it could just be one. What are yours? I have never been asked. Well, I'm asking you now. Fuck, I don't know. I, I, that's hard. I, I could think of one. I guess I would say, like, for me, what what am I currently working on that's been really hard? I, I would say, I would say, be more yourself. Um, I spent I've spent so much of my life trying to be someone else, either subconsciously or consciously, and you know, I was really fat when I was a kid, and that was like a version of being someone else. So I was like that, the funny, jovial, plump guy who was like the 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 comic relief. And then I lost all this weight and I spent my twenties trying to be like what I thought I wanted, which was to be like the fifth Hemsworth brother, like <laughs> just the dapper leading man, the natural alpha. And it's only now at 31 and I'm sure it'll be a lifelong process. Have I slowly sort of realized that the relationships I have and anything of worth in my life has been cultivated by me being myself. And I find that I'm, almost always rewarded when I'm not trying to put on any airs. Mm -hmm. um, so if I had to give one, I'd say be more yourself. That's good. Take it to the bank. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think one, like kind of in, in line with that is owning who you are. I think that, you know, people have been so like shamed into not owning the things that they're good at or the, you know, good qualities that they have, you know, we're trained, I'm a painter, for example. And so it's like, when somebody is like, oh, wow, you're a really good painter, you know, everyone's trained to be like, no, no, I'm, you know, and yeah. instead of saying like, thank you, because, you know, like, and this sounds cocky, but like, I, that is something I'm good at doing. And being able to say that about yourself and say like, of knowing and owning the things that you are and not feeling like you can't be proud of those things, you know, and, and it's not, it's not in a cocky or egotistical way. It's just in a way of like, this is who I am. This is what I'm good at. This is what I'm not good at. And not feeling like you have to apologize for that. Um, and, you know, I feel like everyone's so quick to, 
like doubt themselves and to put to just like you know nobody likes saying good things about themselves and I think that it's so important to have to learn how to have that like self-love and self-confidence and like self-worth and being able to just like own who you are and I think when you can own who you are it's much easier to then like allow other people to own who they are and not need to like bring them down and just coming from a place of being able to support everybody when you have that self-esteem you know because I think bullying and being mean to people all of that comes from like having no self-esteem and being angry and not knowing or liking who you are um so I would say that is a big one and I would say like to do art because I think art will save the world yeah mm-hmm. it's just an ex like an ability in which to express or in in what way I think my my favorite like if I wasn't an actor I would be a teacher my favorite thing in the entire world is to do art with kids, which I do a lot um, at like inner city arts. And I got to go into this classroom at this elementary school and do this art project with them. And it just like, it was the coolest thing. I taught them about colors and color mixing and it blew their mind that I was like, did you know all the colors in the world come from three colors? And That's crazy. being like the first person to show them that like yellow and blue make green, they were like, what? Like yeah, it was that's so, incredible. it was crazy. Um, but I think, you know, with the things that you discover about yourself through art, through doing any sort of art project is so incredible. And things, you know, you would never – think about we'll do art projects with kids and you know you say like oh that's interesting like why did you do that part in all like squiggly lines and you know they're like I don't know I just felt like really like things were crazy and not stable and whatever and it opens up a dialogue and a conversation and a way to see things in a way um almost in like a safe way because it's coming from something artistic and not just from Literal. like, yeah. yeah, and it also, you know, I do this NAMI art class too, um, which is National Alliance on Mental Illness, and we do this painting class, and with them, like, all the people in that class have been like, just the freedom of that you have with art and painting and being able to mess up and learning like there are no mistakes in art and just trying new things and and it, it gives people this, like, confidence and self-esteem that somehow, like, permeates into their real life. Um, but it's just amazing, like, how much people's guards get let down when you give them an art project to do. Yeah. It's really cool. My dream is to, like, open an art center, a free art center for people and kids and when I'm older. I like that. Yeah. Um, what, so you're going to New York in January? Mm-hmm. Where do you, do you have a place there when you're shooting? I did, and then I just, you know, we have, I've been off from that show now for like a year and a half, which is like crazy. Yeah, it's a long time in between seasons. Yeah, because we're going into winter in our storyline, so they want to shoot in the actual winter. Oh, good. I'm so excited. Everybody thinks that I'm crazy, but I grew up in L.A. I've never had a winter. The snow, I love it. So I'm, like, very excited to have my, like, New York winter. Well, you'll get it now. <laughs> and then yes. you'll have done it, and you'll never need it again. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, yeah, we're going from January to June, and then that's it. That's it. It's a wrap. Final season. For how many to go? Four? Yeah, it'll be four. It's great. Mm -hmm. I mean, you obviously, the more the better usually, but... Sometimes you can tell by like seven or the eighth season of something. I'm like, do you still have ideas? Totally. Right? And then you're just like dragging it on. And I can't imagine like, I feel like I'd get bored at a certain point. It's like I want to move on and do other things. Right. 
that I, especially, you know, network shows that are 22 episodes, that's like nine months of oh, your year. If you're on a one, if you're on fucking Law and Order Woodland Hills. <laughs> <laughs> we should write that. <laughs> you're like a CSI Westchester. Like, yeah, that's like a real job. But I mean, they're all so fucking rich. They're like, so whatever. Rich. Oh my Laughing God. Laughing to the bank. Jesus. Well, good for them. But are they happy? <laughs> Probably. Probably. <laughs> Probably <Sounds> not. Awesome. <laughs> Maybe. I'm down if you guys need a co star. Fully. My dream was to be on like Law and Order when I was first started. Law and Order and Gossip Girl. Law Girl. What? <laughs> Write that. You heard it here first, guys. I want credit. That was it. That was Carly. Isn't she the best? So nice. I'm a big fan of hers. So glad she did the pod. Um, you should follow her on IG because she has some incredible art at at Carly Chaken Art. Do it. Just take a leap. You know what I mean? Put something new in your feed. I'm telling you, you're going to need it because it's the new year. And aren't you a little tired of hearing the same old from like Cindy who's talking about her New Year's resolution? And you're like, this fucking Cindy, she ain't changing nothing. Come on, let's be honest. So you got to hear from Doug and how he's got this new workout regimen because it's a new year and the new him. And you're like, no, Doug, it's just more of the same old fucking Doug. You know, let's be real here. Yeah, you going to change it up? You haven't yet, and you're 37, Doug. It's not looking good. Maybe you should just be stoked that you work at UPS and, you know, you've got, like, one child who doesn't completely hate you. And that's enough, Doug. Anyway, we've all got a Doug. Love you guys. Happy New Year. Thank you for listening. Okay, bye.